Hello, and welcome to Marathon Swim Stories, where we explore the human side of the superhuman feats of endurance swimmers and those who support them. I'm marathon swimmer and coach Shannon Keegan. Today's guest started swimming in the sea to support his surfing interests. Then he took up prone paddling to further his fitness. It wasn't until he happened to cross a couple swimmers who happened to need a paddler that he discovered the wonders of marathon swimming. Inspired by their feats of endurance, it didn't take long for them to take Scott Tapley under their wings and help him realize what he was capable of. I hope you enjoy Scott's story. All right. Today, my guest is Scott Tapley. Thank you so much for being my guest. <laughs> tell tell me. me. <laughs> <laughs> What's your story, Scott? Yeah. So um, my story, you know, when I think about, so, I mean, we're talking about swimming, marathon swimming. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I mean, to start off with, I think like a lot of people, I know that I think your audience is probably made up mostly of marathon swimmers. These are well, not- Or aspiring. People, Sometimes know, or aspiring there's some marathon swimmers, right? <laughs> So I think I'm, I'm kind of like uh, saying something that's probably true for a lot of people when it comes to open water or marathon swimming. And it's, you know, for me, it's really my, it's my solitude. You know, I think it's become my medicine. It's mm-hmm. my mental health in a lot of ways, like more than, I mean, I think a lot of people would probably identify with that. Uh, for me, it's very spiritual. It's, it's become like the ocean is my church. That's awesome. uh, you know, just all that stuff. And I think that, you know, I, I'm probably preaching to the choir on a lot of those things, but it's also, it's like, I found that the ocean and, and open water swimming, especially swimming in the sea is a place where I go to find um, like answers to the questions that I didn't even know I had yet. You know, that kind of thing. I love that. Okay. I go out there (laughs) and I think, or I don't think, Mm -hmm. or I let my mind wander, or I try to heal, or whatever it is. And, um, you know, I mean, I can do work out there. I can come up with new ideas. I can solve problems. (laughs) I can, you know, let go of things that are, you know, that are not healthy for me mentally or physically or whatever. So it's like this amazing. Uh, thing that's become part of my life that I didn't have, you know, I started marathon swimming later in life. So I didn't really start, you know, what people would consider marathon swimming until I was in my forties. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, unlike a lot of my friends and I see these kids these days and, you know, doing amazing things, you know, it's just just like mind blowing. Right. 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 Yeah. um, I'm wondering where they'll be, you know, when they're like, yeah. right. You know, you think about kids like the Rivards and, you know, and like James Savage and, Angel Moore and all these people mm-hmm. that are just like constantly impressing me in and in and out of the water, right? You know, Absolutely. you meet them and they're just these humble, like super, like well beyond their years, you know. Yeah. Kids. yeah. They're, like, they're special, special. Yes. So, yeah. Um, but I didn't start swimming, you know, at an early age. Um, but I do think that my, when you think about like uh, oh, marathon swimming or open water swimming, I feel like my story, you know, when you say, what's your story, I feel like my story (laughs) started as a kid because, um, I mean, I had parents that were super into the outdoors. They were like climbing and, you know, mountaineering and, you know, backpacking. And so as a child, as a little child, we did a lot, we spent a lot of time in the outdoors. And part of that was not, uh, not just in the mountains, but at the beach as well. So, I mean, I have all these really fond memories of, you know, body surfing with my dad and getting so cold. And you know, that feeling you get from getting so cold, but then the rewarming process and all Mm -hmm. that. So I think that was like kind of drilled into me at a very early age. Yeah. Um, Just that, what, you know, just that, what you get out of that, that payback, Mm -hmm. you know, to putting yourself in the sea and and submerging yourself in the sea. And then my family also spent a lot of, as a kid, we spent a lot of summers up in Tahoe. So, um, you know, when I was like, two or three years old, my dad and my grandfather built a, a house up there at the lake. Oh, cool. And so from the time, I mean, before I can remember from the time I can walk or even, you know, like about that time, um, we were at, you know, we were in, we were spending time at San Harbor and, you know, and uh, all the beaches around Lake Tahoe and uh, Northern Lake Tahoe. And uh, I don't know, you've probably been to Tahoe. I think, you know, you've been, you swam Tahoe, I think. Look so I think everybody that ever <laughs> has spent any time in Tahoe is familiar with San Harbor. Mm. but um san harbor has these swim buoys out there mm-hmm. and they've been there since you know forever since like 
I don't know, it was like probably at least at least the late sixties, early seventies, those swim movies have been out there. And, you know, I remember, I can remember, I have memories of being a little kid and standing on the beach and um, watching my dad like swim out to the buoy and think he was going like to, you know, like to, to Japan or something. Yeah, you know, exactly. Like, I don't know where he was going. It was really, really far. Yep. And then eventually, you know, he started bringing me out there and it was like this idea of going out there and being so vulnerable and like, mm -hmm. you know, it was just like, it, it really hooked me, you know, and I became just, I really be, fell in love with the water and like being in that open water, mm. even though I wasn't, you know, I wasn't part of like the age group swim team or anything like that. I was just <laughs> super into the, into the water. Um, so that's kind of where I think it started for me. And then, um, you know, and then you kind of, you know, you live your life. But then when I was about 14 or 15, I came home with a surfboard. <laughs> And my mom wasn't happy about that. She's <laughs> like, you're not doing that. You know, you're going to die. And uh, of course she came around. And so um, I started surfing as a teen. And um, then I was really hooked because, you know, it's not like most surfers that have surfed their whole life will tell you it's not, it's not uh, a sport as much as it is just like a way of life. And, mm -hmm. and it, you know, I, I lived it every day. I was obsessed with it. And if I wasn't surfing or there weren't any waves and I couldn't surf, I was either you know, swimming or body surfing or riding skateboards or, you know, things like that. So, you know, kind of related to that. So um, I got super hooked into surfing uh, as a kid. And then that was my thing, like all growing up. So I was always in the ocean. Um, and then it wasn't, you know, as you get older, surfing, you start seeking out bigger and bigger waves and you start mm -hmm. traveling. Mm -hmm. and, you know, you take trips to Hawaii and, you know, I was lucky enough to have uh, to take a trip to the North Shore and see like really big waves in the winter. Cool. And so, I mean, that was just like, oh my God, you know, like what's possible. So when I came home from those trips, I, I was like, well, I need to get in better shape. I need to get stronger. I need, uh -huh. to, get, you know, I need to build up my, um, just my physicality just so that I could even survive. I was like life and death. Right. So yeah. you start, that's when I got into swimming in the ocean. Interesting. I started swimming and, mm -hmm. um, you know, so mostly swimming alone around here in Santa Cruz and Monterey Bay where I live. And, um, back when I started, there weren't a lot of, now there's a lot of like triathlon clubs and meetups and things like that. But back then there were really nobody out. I mean, you'd maybe see somebody out swimming, but there weren't people like swimming in the ocean right? You know, up here, at least because the water's cold. Mm -hmm. well, it's a lot different than Southern California, but, um, so, you know, I heard about the Alcatraz swim. So we signed up and went and did the South End Rowing Club, you know, Alcatraz swim. And I did that a couple of years. And, you know, I, I thought I was pretty badass when I did that. I was like, <laughs> oh, yeah, you know, I swam from Alcatraz. And I had no idea. Like, I was clueless. I had no idea what people in the sport, you know, outside of those swims, outside of those organized events were doing, like, on mm -hmm. their own. I didn't, I didn't know about solos or, you know, marathon swims. And, I'd heard of the English channel. Everybody's heard of that. And right. I'm like, you know, oh my God. So, so, you know, I'm, I'm swimming to stay in shape for surfing and I started prone paddling. I don't know if are you familiar with prone paddling. It's, it's not stand up paddle boarding, right. it's, it's like paddling, like an oversized surfboard. Mm -hmm. And, but you go miles and miles offshore, but you're laying down and paddling with your arms. So it's you yeah. know, all, it's kind of like great cross training for, uh, yeah. for and surfing. And so we, you know, I would do that to stay in shape for the winter. And so I'd come down and I'd go, you know, run down to the beach and I'd go out and um, I was training. I started, I got kind of got into like paddleboard racing and stuff. So I had, uh, I had a dream that someday maybe I would paddle from Catalina. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's like what the big kids did, you know, the big pros, like all the Mavericks guys, you know, and all the Southern California lifeguards and like everybody. Awesome. Okay. trains and paddles from Catalina. I was like, that's the, yeah, that's what I'm going to do someday. So I was out there paddling and, you know, doing like, I'd go out and paddle for like three or four hours. And, um, I started noticing, I'm, I go down to this one beach by my house, uh, which is, um, like, uh, New Brighton beach. And now that's where all the sharks hang out. But um, <laughs> <laughs> now we have like a real, we have a lot of great whites in the cove in there. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so that used to be our swimming training ground and, you know, kind of paddle place. But now it's, we wait, they all go away in the early winter. So we swim okay. in the winter, but not during Interesting. The yeah. So that's a little side thing, but um, <laughs> so I'm down there, I'm down there paddling and I take off in the morning and I'd go out and paddle for like, like I said, like three or four hours. And I started noticing 
there were these two women that were always swimming down there, you know, no wetsuits, just a swimsuit cap and goggles. And they'd be down there swimming, you know, and I'd wave, I didn't, you know, who they were. And I'm like, okay, you know, I'm going to go paddle for three hours. Yeah. But I was pretty cool. You know, I go yeah. up <laughs> and go way out to these outer buoys and stuff. But I started realizing I'd come back after three hours They're and like one swimming. of them were still swimming, <laughs> Yeah. you know, and I'm going, who are these people? Like, you know, what are they doing? And so um, I kind of, I come, came to find out that, um, you know, eventually I met both of them and one of them is Kim Rutherford, who you mm-hmm. interviewed. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, Kim would be down there for three or four hours just swimming by herself, you know, back and forth to the cement ship in our cove. And, you know, this was like when the water was, you know, like 54, 55, she'd be out there all day, you know, swimming. And, uh, and then I met uh, the other woman that was down there, um, Suzanne uh, Redinger. And Suzanne is, I don't know if you've ever, if mm-hmm. you know who Suzanne is, but she's, she's in her 70s still. I think she might be like 76 or something now, but she, uh, she swims every day still. She is the uh, third person to swim from Anacapa ever, wow. uh, right after David Udevin and Cindy Cleveland. Um, she swam Catalina back in the eighties and she's just mm-hmm. an old time, you know, like water woman, you know, super woman mm-hmm. she's down there swimming every day. And so I got, I started talking to her and she's like, well, you know, and she introduced me to Kim and said, Hey, you like to paddle. Kim likes to swim I want to paddle <laughs> for, you know, like we need someone to paddle with us while we swim. Yeah. So I thought that was pretty cool. So I started, uh, you know, Kim kind of like trained me how to paddle next to a swimmer and feed a swimmer and do all mm-hmm. these things. So I started out like in this support role, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I was just doing like one or two mile swims and then I was paddling. And so. And that's what uh, era is this in your life? Twenties, thirties. This is, I'm like in it's my forties. Okay. Uh, I'm like, yeah. So this is like, uh, so you've been surfing did, it up for yeah, years, my whole just life, training. years okay. ocean swimming, body surfing, um, you know, paddling, but, and a little bit, you know, just, ocean swimming, like in the one to two mile range, okay. you know, at, at tops. And, um, and so now I've, now I've met these two people that have kind of opened my mind, opened my brain to what's possible, you know, and mm-hmm. I still didn't really get it. I didn't know. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, they, they kind of like tricked me, talked me into paddling, like, go paddle with us. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Next thing you know, I'm on a training paddle with Kim Rutherford and I'm out there for, um, you know, like, like nine hours or something, you know, wow. like right. I you just step up your paddling. Yeah. yeah. I can barely <laughs> paddle and she's still swimming. Wow. And so, um, that led to me supporting her on her Catalina crossing. Mm-hmm. So that was my first experience on a boat, you know, open water, like a big channel crossing. And mm-hmm. I was just blown away. I couldn't believe that this was even possible, you know, and I'm talking to her other paddler, this young girl from Southern California on the boat and Cindy Cleveland, um, who was the first person to swim Anacapa. Mm-hmm. And I think the first person to do a double Anacapa and circumnavigate like 50 miles around Catalina. You know, she's like an old time legendary, like swimming person in life. Mm-hmm. She's also the first person to ever swim the Monterey Bay mm-hmm. right here in my backyard. So yeah. and that was in the eighties. So here's this, these legends, you know, like this legend on the boat and they're just all very casual about it. Oh yeah. 20 miles, 30 miles, whatever. Yeah. And I, I, I couldn't, couldn't believe it. I was very inspired. So I thought, you know, maybe I'll try to swim something longer, you know? And so that led to Kim talking me into doing Anacapa, like swimming the Santa Barbara channel. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I wasn't too sure about it, but she talked me into training for that. And so that was, um, probably about 2011, 2012, something like that. Okay. And, um, and so I started training for that. And then that kind of in, in the middle of training for that, somehow I got talked by into, uh, by Kim as well to swimming a, an ice swim. So okay. <laughs> people on your show probably know what an ice swim yep. is, you know, sub five Celsius below 40 degrees or 41 degrees, something like that, um, for a mile uh, swimsuit cap and goggles and all that. So we ended up training for that. And, uh, in 2013, I think we were, I think we were the first and maybe still the only people to do, um, a, like a documented ice swim or an ice mile. I mean, in, uh, in California water. Oh, wow. Yeah. Because it's so hard to find that kind of cold water in California. Mm -hmm. And the only place you could really find it is Lake Tahoe. Yeah. And in a lot of days still aren't, you know, below 41, or they're mm-hmm. so cold, like the wind chill and everything. It's not really, 
feasible to do do it safely. So um, we did that in 2013. Awesome. Yeah, and then I went on to swim Anacapa, and then you know you know how, I mean you know how it is. It's like you do Anacapa, and people are like, "What's next?" Yeah. What is, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I thought I was done. But they're like, no. How did it go? Well, what was your I, first? What was your first uh, one like? It was rough. I don't think I trained enough. You know, I thought, mm. uh, you know, I have a lot of ocean experience. So I was really comfortable in the ocean. I felt, but, um, but it was, it was a rough day. It was very, very choppy, very windy. Um, I did not have good conditions. I thought it was going to take me like seven hours. It took me um, over 10 hours. You know, it was one of the, I mean, yeah. I'm not fast to begin with, but you know, I'm like not that slow, but it definitely took a <laughs> while to get there. Um, but I finished it. So I was happy to finish it. How did it feel? <laughs> oh, it felt amazing. And I, I have to tell you the most, the coolest thing about it was, I mean, I learned right off the bat that we have no, like that swim really drilled it home for me that we have no idea what we're capable of. Right. Mm-hmm. And that so much of it is just decided up in, up in here, not you know, like down here, you have to do the work, but like up here is a, such a big part of it. And it's huge. Yeah. That swim was really uh, eye opening for me because I thought that I was going to do it in seven hours and I thought I was maybe capable of swimming eight hours. Mm-hmm. Like that was kind of like the, it, like my, the size of my gas tank. You know, I thought right. eight <laughs> hours was as much as I could ever do. And then I would have to get on the boat mm-hmm. and you know, like no watch, whatever you just swim and swim and swim until you hit the sand. And so that's what I did. And, you know, and it was like, Oh, like whatever it was, 10 something. And I'm like, I'm like, no, that's not possible. Like, the <laughs> line, the watch must be broken, you know. But the coolest thing about it was, I was actually more excited that it went long because I was kind of impressed with myself that I could swim for that long. Yeah, and, that's it's fascinating to me that you thought you had like a cap, like you're like, oh, yeah. eight o'clock, eight hours, I'm just right. gonna break. <laughs> right, exactly. And uh, so that idea went completely out the window, you know, yeah. from the first experience because then I started thinking, wow, you know, like you just but you have no idea what you're capable of, you know, mm-hmm. no, no matter what people tell you, no matter what you tell yourself, like the boundaries are pretty much limitless um, or they're way beyond maybe what you think they are. That's for right. sure. Um, yeah. Did you have to have anyone like push you to get you through that? Or you, you were just surprised it was eight, whatever, or 10, I was whatever. Surprised. I think I was, I was like, you know, some people get out of the water and they look fresh and, you know, I mean, I was pretty tired at the end, but um, uh but I had gone into the swim. I had good training. I had good coaches, like you know, good mentors and good coaches here. Mm-hmm. Um, people like Suzanne and Kim and, and others, you know, preparing me that like getting out was not really an option. Okay. Uh, deciding <laughs> to get you. pulled or quit was never really an option. Like I had to hand that over to them, mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. the crew or the observers or whatever, you know, and it was just, my job was just to swim until either I got there or somebody told me to get out. And yeah. So that's how I've approached like all my swims. That's and, good. That's really know. good. Yeah. And, like, so and I that, have, I've had DNFs, so <laughs> it's like, but it wasn't me that pulled myself. It was, yeah. you know, it's never like, I just swim until they tell me to get out. That's, or, that's, or good. <laughs> that's good advice. I'm not sure that anyone's ever really said it like that. Like the way you said, you know, you hand over the reins, you're like, it is not up to me. My job is to swim until I get pulled. I really like thinking of it like that. <laughs> yeah, and on the support side, you see the people that think too much and like yeah. are constantly trying to analyze everything and it's like they sabotage themselves. But, um, and then you see the people that just get in and swim and they make it look easy. So yeah. you know, I yeah. try to lean more. I try to yeah, learn absolutely. That. Go yeah. that direction. Yeah. Yeah, but that was, yeah, that was Catalina. That was in 2014 and- Oh, wait, no, that was Anna, Santa Barbara Channel was the one. Santa Barbara, just... oh, Santa Barbara Channel was 2013. Mm-hmm. And then I did okay. Catalina. So then okay. that kind of led, you know, it's like the Alcatraz is the gateway drug. <laughs> yeah, you do your, you know, your 10Ks. Because I did yeah. some 10Ks locally. I did like yeah. 30 years and stuff like that. And then that leads to your 20K and then your, you know, and then your 30 or you 40K. Think... Or... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I think that that's people... That's how it happens for most people. Um, some people, it's interesting to me. Some people say they like they get by, got bit by the bug, and then they 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 want. They're like, "What's next?" But I heard you say, then people started asking me, "What's next?" So did you yeah. think like, "Oh, what else could I do?" Or did you think it was more like you're like, "Oh, well, I guess I could try something else." You know, like <laughs> yeah, I think that was kind of like yeah. I thought I thought that I was just going to do that one swim, mm-hmm. and then I'd go back mm-hmm. to surfing, and you know, and 
you know, like not have to think so much, not have to train and do all that stuff. But, yeah. You know, so I, I thought I would just go back to like the lifestyle. Right. And, uh, <laughs> And then, uh, and then if somebody says, well, you should do this or, you know, what's next. And, and you kind of go, oh yeah, you know, that was pretty, felt good. And one of the things that I learned kind of along the way, so you go from Anacapa to Catalina. And one of the things that became very apparent to me is that, uh, is that it's the events really cool. Finishing those swims is really great. It's a great feeling to finish the swims. It's fun to be included, you know, in a list or whatever, but, um, but it's so much uh, about the process. I mean, I know it sounds really corny, but it's like the journey, not the destination. Totally not corny. And it's just that, <laughs> it's just that like with these things, it's like anything in life. It doesn't have to be swimming, but you know, you, you set some, a goal that's really outside your comfort zone. That's really scary and seems impossible. And then you have to do all the work in between. And so it's the day to day, it's the getting up at three or four in the morning, you know, going to practices and going down to the ocean and swimming. And, um, and then, you know, you have, that's where all the, that's where all the growth happens. That's where all the introspection, all the learning, and you know, it's like the bigger the goal and the, you know, the more outrageous it is, the longer it takes to get there. So maybe that's like two mm -hmm. years or four years or whatever. Now you have that whole piece in between where every day, you know, you're outside your comfort zone a little bit and you're learning something and you're growing and, um, you know, it's scary. And, uh, and then, and then the, the, the payback for all that, like aside from the event at the end, aside from getting to go like land on a beach somewhere, you meet all these amazing people, you know, oh, along the way and everybody's helping each other and it becomes about the community. And mm -hmm. that was a big thing that got drilled into me first. Like I started out in a support role, became a swimmer. And I still don't really think of myself as a swimmer. I'm more like a <laughs> surfer that like started swimming or something. <laughs> it's like, you know, like, there's like real swimmers, probably like you're a real swimmer. You know, I, I swim with some real swimmers. But I don't really think of myself as like a swimmer. Um, my, my friend, uh, Robin Rose, you know, you, I think you interviewed Robin. Mm -hmm. She jokes and says, Oh yeah, you're not a real swimmer. But at one point, this was a few years ago. She goes, yeah, you always say you're not a swimmer, but you have three English channel tides booked or something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, that doesn't make me a swimmer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like maybe foolish or something, but um, yeah, but it's about all the people you meet along the way and all the relationships. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, like, I think that most people, you know, that would listen to this would know that, you know, if have probably learned by now that channel swimming is not an individual sport, right? It's a team not sport. All, right. It's a team sport. And um, I mean, that makes me think of like all the people. So like in every sport, we have our heroes, you know, and mm -hmm. we have our people that we look to and we're inspired by, you know, we have all these heroes um, in the sport, but I, you know, like I always come back to the people that really like stand out to me and the people that you start seeing, like their names everywhere, like in social media or like in, at events and things, it's always the people that are giving back, you know, the mm. people that are constantly there like of service. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, don't, I mean, don't you see that? It's yeah. Like, I mean, this sport, like every sport, I mean, I think we have a lot of, um, there's a lot of self promoters. There's a lot of big egos, like in any sport. But yeah. It's yeah. the people that really, I think are the real heroes of the sport are, um, the people that are just constantly, you know, like trying to pay it forward and help other people, you know, mm -hmm. make their dreams come true or mm -hmm. see what's possible. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. It, um, we brought this up for me, like this, the team thing, like there's, there's something to me about being like on a team that I don't like, I grew up, you know, age group swimming, whatever. And I was, it's an individual sport and, you know, like we do a team cheer cause we got however many points, but it, but I like later discovered team sports and it was like, wow, this is what it's like to like, you know, feel like have a role and a responsibility. And just like the way you were talking about the team thing, you know, I've always felt it, but it, like the, the, the feeling I get at the end of a marathon swim is like, we did it. You know, it's like that I had yeah, this exactly. like, and then we all worked together and like this happened. Right. And I'm exactly, getting goosebumps yeah. just thinking about it. Cause I just love it. Um, yeah, and I anyway. always think of it like that too, where people say, you know, oh, how was your swim this weekend? You know, like go do Catalina or something. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, well, we started out at this time and we went <laughs> okay, like all of us together on this big adventure. You know, mm -hmm. It's kind of like, you know, you think about 
um, you know, we think about the first person who stepped on the moon or something. You know? <laughs> think about how many people were involved in making Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah. I mean, Catalina is not the moon, but like it's, you know, but there right. is, it does take a team. It takes, and then there's the whole extended team, not just the people on the boat, all the people that have helped you along the way. Yeah. And your family. And, you know, what did they give up while you were training? Yeah. You know, 30, 40,000 yards or whatever, you know, 12, 15 hours a week. Um, I mean, it's just a, like a lot of people are involved in making these things happen um, mm -hmm. for you. And of course that leads to like total gratitude, right? So it's, yeah. you know, when you think about it and when you're swimming, like you think about how grateful you are that all these people come out to support you or mm -hmm. have supported you through the years of training and everybody's made sacrifices, not just the athlete. And yeah. then, and then, you know, like there's no guarantees, like the weather is bad yeah. you get sick the day before an injury flares up, whatever. And then it just seems like no matter what happens, all that support is still there. It's like, you know, it's like still totally there, like no matter what happens with your swim. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really cool. Um, I mean, it's a cool sport to be a part of just be, I think just because of the community, like because of the people involved. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. The gratitude. I try to think a lot of like, what do I want? You know, why do I want more people to ex not, ex I'm not like I'm trying to recruit every marathon swimmer, but it's like, it's been so fulfilling for me. And like, and then I wonder, well, why has it been fulfilling for me? So we're just touching on all the things. And I'm just like, yeah, like you want people to experience like that gratitude and that, yeah. and that feeling of accomplishing more than you thought that you could. I just, it's, I yeah, it's like such a good it's kind of like such a good, not like a drug, right? So you're sitting there and you're like, wow, this is so amazing. Yeah. You know, I want to push it. I'm the pusher now. I want to push it on yeah, other exactly. people, right? Push it on, other people. it on other people. I'm a drug dealer. Know, it's the ocean, you know, the fountain of youth. And, yeah. um, you know. I make you, it feel it, like it makes us better people though. That's arrogant, but. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah I think it forces us to be um, introspective. And I think it forces mm -hmm. us to be more like honest. That's the cool mm -hmm. thing about the ocean true is. Too. So like, I mean, I love lake swimming and everything, but I'm going to, I kind of relate a lot to the sea and especially where we live in Monterey Bay, it's a very active, like a live ocean with a lot yeah. of sea life and things. Right. So, you know, you go out and you swim out here, but really anywhere, it doesn't matter if you're, even in, if you're in a lake, but, um, or a river, even that's rivers are pretty scary, but you know, it's one of those, I mean, where, where it's kind of like the mountains or big mountains where you go into these places, like you go into the sea and one minute, you're absolutely terrified you know there's like shadows and things swimming around you that can eat you and the next minute like five seconds later you're euphoric you know yeah. you're like just filled with all this like endorphins and positivity and your mind is and you're happy so you can be terrified and euphoric like in the same moment right right yeah yeah or, you're, or you start to get confident like you're emboldened but then you're completely humbled five seconds later, you know, because yeah. the ocean is big and in charge. Yeah. Yeah, totally. You know, or at night or something. And I think that all of that kind of that like yin and yang of the ocean, like that kind of where you can be terrified and, and, and feel high and, you know, all in the same moment. I think that it's, um, it leads, I think it forces us to be super, super honest with ourselves. Like it's a place where you can't hide. That's you very true. Yep. You can't hide from your mind out there. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, people can put on an act or whatever, yeah. the phone, yep. play tough and, you know, on the beach. But when you're out there in the middle of the night in the dark and you're looking into the abyss, I mean, it's like, it forces us to be brutally, brutally honest with ourselves, even just mm -hmm. for a moment. And I think that's good for us, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, yeah. that's really hits home with me too. Cause I just like, the, I'm like this honesty is like, is my policy kind of person, but it like to, but, but is it, you know, like to put yeah. yourself in a situation where you've got to, you know, like stare yourself in the face and be like, right. what, you know, what now <laughs> are you going to keep doing it? <laughs> I don't know. I love that. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, you know, it's, people come out of the water and they, you know, I mean, like, I, I think one of the cool things about the sport is that it's so pure. I mean, I, th yeah. I think it's one of the few sports where there's like an entire global around the world community of people who are really fighting to keep the sport pure, you know, right. to, to keep it honest and transparent and pure mm -hmm. to keep, um, you know, 
honest, like accurate records of, you know, what's happening in the swimming world and what has happened in the history. And, um, and then not to let too much technology or, you know, advantage come into the, into mm-hmm. the sport. And I think something that I really love about it, like people, I mean, you know, people, the, one of the first things they ask you, or they'll say is, you know, you wear a wetsuit, right? Right. Like, yeah. Well, no, you did a swim. You're like, no, I didn't wear a wetsuit. Yeah. Um, and they'll yeah. go, why not? You know, yeah. you have to explain it. Yep. But that's just the beauty of the sport, right? It's so pure. Exactly. Right. Yeah. I'm like you held onto the boat, right? No. Yeah. <laughs> right. Just because you can get away with it doesn't mean you should, right? right. So, but that's why we have observers. And, you know, mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, so. Exactly. Keep it pure. All right. Let's get back to your story. Catalina was next. What happened to Catalina? <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So, I, Catalina was, I think, it, you know, Yvonne Chouinard, who founded Patagonia, he always mm-hmm. says, um, he says something like uh, adventure is you know, like you make a plan, but whatever adventure is when um, the plan goes wrong or when things go bad. So it's like something like that. I'm, I'm not getting it exactly right, but it's like adventure starts when things go wrong. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I feel like yeah. every one of my swims have been an adventure based on that definition. So, you know, you, you make a plan, you do the work, but nothing ever goes as you expect. Mm-hmm. Um, so Catalina, right? So I'm, I'm getting nervous. I'm getting ready to swim Catalina. Like I'm about to go board the boat. Um, and I crack my head open on, I, I'm taking the paddle boards off the boat. So I mean, off the roof of the car. So I've got okay. paddle boards and I take the, and I smack my, crack my head open on one of the skegs. Oh, man. And I feel like I might have a little concussion and I'm bleeding. I've got a cut, you know? So I, <laughs> I'm wearing a hat so nobody can see it. I put a bandage on and then before we went to the it's swim, good. I had a hat and then I like pulled the hat off and put my swim cap on and I'm still, <laughs> I had this huge lump on my head, but I didn't want to tell, like, you know, you probably know Dan Simonelli. Yeah. I didn't want him to see it because I was afraid he wouldn't let me swim. And, you know, <laughs> and so I'm sitting there like going, oh, you know, I'll be okay. <laughs> It'll feel better once I start swimming. Um, <laughs> I can everything. And so that's how my Catalina swim started. And then, um, and then, so we're motoring out on the boat and I had done what everybody, you know, what you do, you visualize the swim, you try to visualize success. And I pictured myself getting in at Doctor's Cove at night, you know, and lining up with the boat and then the whole getting out at Terrania and how was I going to climb up on the rocks, you know, and all that stuff. And uh, we were not maybe 10 minutes out of the harbor and the captain pulled me over to the um, pilot house of the boat and said, you know, the currents have been really good for swimmers going the other way. Why don't don't we have you swim from the mainland to the island? Oh. (laughs) just kind of threw a twist in there at the last minute. And uh, and I said, okay, whatever you think is best. (laughs) And so I ended up, you know, now it's dark and I'm climbing up on the rocks at Terrania, which if you've ever, anybody that's listening to this has ever done, has landed at Terrania. Seen pictures, but yeah. Yeah. I don't know why that's like the worst beach to, <laughs> end, you know, a swim at, um, especially at the end when you're so tired, but it's so rocky and the surge of the ocean's always like dragging people over those rocks. Oh man. But, um, so I'm starting out there and I'm oh, man. You know, kind of a little dizzy from getting whacked in the head. And oh my gosh. But I climb up on that thing and you know, they do the thing and start and I clear the water, I come back in. But right off the bat, I mean, I, I think by the time I even got caught up in, next to the boat, I had dolphins swimming around me, you know, right off uh Palos Verdes there. And so wow. all these dolphins, it was, you know, at night. And I couldn't see them, but I could hear them and then I could kind of feel them in the water really close. And wow. Well, it started out pretty cool and I figured that was a good sign um but it turned out like if you know the California coast our winds predominantly come out of the northwest and so it was uh that that night and the following day it turned out to be quite windy mm. and so um I ended up swimming I think what Dan would say uphill <laughs> backwards and uphill or whatever but oh, I swam geez. like against kind of head, 10 knot headwinds pretty much like the whole swim from start to finish So I thought that I was going to, I thought that was going to be, like I said, I'm not a fast swimmer. So I thought maybe 14 hours, 13 and a half, something like that. And uh, it went like over 17 and a half hours. It was just, I was beating into the wind. And, um, but again, you know, I didn't know what time it was. I just kept swimming and I got out and, 
Um, the current Any headache or anything after the head trauma. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think I completely forgot about that. After, you know, <laughs> 12 hours of swimming <laughs> that had just gone away. Yeah. And I was just like kind of in survival mode, hmm. but, um, but yeah, I mean, it's such a beautiful body of water and it's so blue and um, warm. It's really warm, you know, pretty warm by if you, if you live in Santa Cruz, Catalina feels pretty warm. Right? I, I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, the usually people get, it gets colder to the mainland. So did it get warmer on the way to yes, Catalina? So that was one That's of the advantages of going the other way is that huh. um, it started out like right when I got in, I think it was 57. And then when I got out at Catalina, it was like 69 or something. Oh my gosh. It was really warm. Wow. Yeah, right, right at the island. But the yeah. current was really strong around the island. I think I almost missed the island. And, you know, they're huh. telling me, go, go, go. And I, you know, I was like, completely tired but i uh, how many people have done the reverse i'm not sure i think you know fewer people have gone mainland to island than yeah. the other way. that's not the standard way but a mm-hmm. lot of people have done it yeah that way <laughs> yeah either just, uh, probably by choice but um i didn't plan it that way but that's how it ended up and then it, <laughs> when it was done of course it's one of those things where you go well not as many people have done it so i'm glad i did it that way yeah you know? yeah <laughs> even though it was maybe a little you know windier like maybe it took me longer to get there i was glad that it just happened the way it did yeah that's yeah. great yeah please i don't because like i don't really care as much i don't really care that much about my times i just you know it's finishing and kind of what does the whole experience have to you know bring to me and all that stuff. yeah did you learn anything from that one <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those things that I keep learning again and again with these mm-hmm. swims is that, you know, you're only in control to a certain point. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have to, um, you have to set the goal and then, um, put that aside, make a plan, put that aside, do the work and then whatever happens, you know, just be grateful. Yeah. Uh, and then again, it was, it was a kind of a reinforcement of that lesson that, you really have no idea what you're capable of. Um, mm-hmm. you know, Cause again, I didn't think I could swim 17 hours, but right. <laughs> I had done, I think the most I had swum prior to that was like 10 hours or something or 10, you know, 10 and a half hours. And then I thought maybe, well, now I can stretch that out to maybe like 13 or 14, right. and, you know, then you do 17. So I get, so I have this like kind of really, to me was a big epic, you know, adventure, went super long. I went the wrong way and everything, um, against the wind. And then, uh, we come back and the boat was ready to go out for another swim. So as soon as we came back, we were on the outrider and, uh, I come back and there was the, re- there was a relay going out on the same boat when we came back going out on outrider. And it was a women's, I think over 60 or like a women over 60 relay. So six women over 60, um, going out to do a relay and it was a bunch of the you know like long time swimmers that have all soloed Catalina and done the English channel and all this stuff so they were going out so I stopped and chatted with them as I was getting off the boat and they go yeah we're you know we we followed your swim it was like looked like it was like an epic swim it looked like it was a tough one and all this stuff they go well now English channel is going to be easy <laughs> and I, and I had never had any intention or never any thought at all of going to English channel <laughs> But I have to tell you, like having those ladies sit there with their like smiley, like glowy, healthy, you know, like these athletic, you know, women in their 60s go or or I think some of them are even older than that. You know, they were like, oh, yeah, you know, English Channel, you got to do that next. Of course. (laughs) Of course. Of course. There's like no question about it. So I was kind of like, oh, no, I don't know. Maybe, you know, and then that definitely planted a seed, though. Uh, Yeah, totally. (laughs) Maybe it will be easier than my calories. <laughs> so, you know, like, exactly. Maybe I can do that. So, of course, that was there, you know, mm-hmm. 2014. And then I kind of had it in the back of my mind going to the English Channel. And, um, but then I got busy because, you know, we talk about the, the um, giving back and the team side of the sport, the mm-hmm. support side. Uh, I ended up getting connected with uh, Patty Barnfein and, Joel Wilson and Kim Rutherford and Robin Rose. And we ended up like all, uh, co-founding the Monterey Bay Swim Association. Mm-hmm. Because we all live right here. We swim here every day. Um, there had been at the time there had been, so uh, Cindy Cleveland had done the swim, Kim Rutherford and Patty had done the swim. So there were three people, three women that had done the swim and um, no men had done a, you know, a marathon swim, no wetsuit, you know, marathon swim. So the bay, we have this amazing venue here, this incredible bay of water. 
that's like from harbor to harbor is exactly 25 miles, you know, from Santa Cruz to Monterey. Mm -hmm. And so we have this great course, 25 miles, cold water, a lot of wildlife, you know, it's, it's kind of just like waiting to be opened up as this great venue. Um, but we were also concerned that we were going to, you know, that we were going to have people coming out saying, Oh, I swam the bay, you know, and like, it, we wanted to have some sort of historical record. Right. Yeah. And yeah. So there was kind of this feeling of we need to protect the venue, protect the bay and, and preserve the integrity of the sport in this mm. place that we love. Interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. It makes so, so much so, sense. You know, we were thinking about how do we do that? And then, but we also wanted to grow the community. So we wanted to start to bring people into the bay and, and like, you know, kind of like introduce Monterey Bay marathon swimming to a lot more people because there were so few people here doing it. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then we also um, started, uh, you know, thinking about how can we promote it? Because it's, you know, it's also, we wanted to bring attention to it. So it's like, we wanted to bring attention to it yet, protect it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, that kind of led to a forming of Monterey Bay Swim Association. And um, we worked closely. We learned a lot from talking to the Catalina Channel Swimming Federation people, Mm -hmm. uh, the Santa Barbara Channel Swimming, the SBCSA. Uh, So we got a lot of advice from people like Scott Zornig and um, Forrest Nelson and Evan Morrison and um, kind of figured out like, you know, how do we create a community focused, completely volunteer only service based nonprofit organization that is entirely dedicated to um, supporting people who want to do longer swims in the bay and maybe want to swim across the bay, mm-hmm. um, bringing uh, kind of deserved attention to anybody that actually goes out and does the swim, mm-hmm. um, but also helping uh, the swim be swims be conducted in a more safe, you know, like in a, in a safe way as well. So like training pilots on swimming safety and right. You know, doing fishing charters is a lot different than piloting swims, right? So right. You know, how do we kind of create this whole community of marathon swimming in Monterey Bay? So since 2015, we've been super dedicated to doing that. And um, so, yeah, the, the people I mentioned, Joel, Patty, Kim, Robin, um, myself, we're all the, the on the board. And I'm, I've been the president for the last couple of years of the Monterey Bay Swim Association. But since then, we now have, um, for those people that don't know Monterey Bay, It's uh, so it's typically like the swim is typically somewhere between like 54 to like 60 degrees. It ranges in there during the summer out Mm -hmm. over the Canyon. It's usually in the mid fifties. So it's a cold water swim. It's cold. cold. Um, The route, the standard route is 25 miles. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it's like a little bit longer than Catalina. Um, People say, you know, I say it's longer than English channel, but it's, you know, anybody that's ever done the English channels, like, it's probably not really longer than English channel, yeah. you know, because of where you probably really land. Yeah. Uh, now we've had eight documented swims. And uh, I think if I went back and looked at the records, it's something like 29 attempts. So um, we, wow. you know, it's about a 27% success rate. Yeah. <laughs> and it's on the uh, ocean's toughest 13 list. And so, mm-hmm. um, you know, we have more and more people interested in coming out to swim. So it's really it's really cool. <laughs> if you're listening to this and yeah. <laughs> you're looking for like the next big challenge, you know, like you've done a, all, a lot of the yeah. big ones and maybe, you know, North Channel, Fairline Islands, whatever, Monterey Bay, put it on your list. Yeah, it's, totally. It's totally. All right. Take us to English Channel one. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, English Channel one. So um, yeah, they planted that seed after Catalina. Um, by this point, you know, by 2014, 2015 marathon swimming and ocean swimming has kind of taken over my life. Um, um, you know, you're still surfing a little bit, (laughs) you know, that's the thing is like, I am. And I like in my, in my mind, like my self image of myself is that, you know, I surf, but then I also realized that like swells, good swells were coming. And if you're a surfer, anybody listening to this, who's a surfer, like you don't pass up a good swell. Right. Like <laughs> swell started coming and I was like, oh, I'm training. I need to swim. You know? So I started feeling guilty. I had this like, <laughs> kind of like this total conflict. Like, am I a surfer? You're not a surfer. You're swimming in the ocean. You know? I had this <laughs> friend who's uh, like a big mountain guy and he's like, lives up in Truckee and he goes, 
hey, how was that swell on Saturday? And I was like, well, I went swimming. <laughs> you know, he's like, what? That's like cross country skiing on a powder day. Like, you can't do that. That's, that's so stupid. Like, what's wrong with you? So I had this sense of guilt, right? You know, I kind of had this like level of guilt and uh, kind of like identity crisis, you know, like I'm not a surfer anymore. <laughs> and, um, I've got like a bazillion, I'm surrounded by surfboards and then like right by the ocean, I could hear the waves from my house, you know, when there's a big swell, <laughs> it's like, here I am thinking about like, how many yards am I going to get in this week? Oh, <laughs> you man. Know, it's like, a, it's just another sickness. And so, um, yeah, but you know, the way I reconciled that was now, like I live down by the beaches. And so when the waves get big, it's like big beach break and there's a lot of white water and it's, you know, a lot of currents and rips. So I started taking my swim fins and going out and just, doing like what I call ins and outs where I'll get through the surf and then I'll swim a mile and then I'll body surf a little bit and nice. then swim another mile then body surf a little bit and then swim back. And so I kind of get the sense that I'm still in the waves and part of that whole thing, but I'm still training. Yeah. <laughs> so that's how I <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's how I trained for English channel was like that. And then I was still doing a little bit of paddling and, but then I had stopped paddling because I wasn't surfing very much. Mm. And then, um, there's a paddle race here that uh, have, we haven't had it for a couple of years because of COVID, but um, uh, it's called the J race. It's a 12 mile, like a, basically like a, uh, a 12 mile offshore, you know, open ocean paddleboard race. And it started out as like this little grassroots thing as a memorial for Jay Moriarty, who was a, a Mavericks, you know, big wave local kid. And, you know, anybody that knows who he was, he was beyond like a big wave surfer, he was just like this really special, nice person that kind of demonstrated aloha and like, you know, what it's like to be, mm -hmm. you know, just a good person. And mm -hmm. so um, when he, he passed away in a free diving accident in oh. like right around 2000. So the community started doing this paddleboard race. And so I, I had done it like 15 years in a row and was super, um, would go out and do it. And you know, people would say, Hey, are you going to do the J this year? You know, whatever. And I was training for the English channel. So I was like, uh, I haven't been paddling or surfing. I've just been swimming. And then, so remember I talked about Suzanne, who was like, mm -hmm. the, you know, kind of the old time marathon swimmer and she, she paddles as well. So she goes out and paddles the J like in her seventies. Like, she, you know, she's just like, she's super just rock star and like one of my biggest inspirations ever. Like, right? so, so Suzanne says to me one day, she goes, why don't you just swim it? just swim the J. <laughs> and I was like, ah, oh, you know, I don't know. Like no one's ever done that. I don't know if that's even possible. You know, they wouldn't allow it or whatever. So yeah, you know, she, she got that in my head. So uh, in 2017, while I was training for my first English channel, um, I got Kim and Robin and some people on a boat and I got my own boat and I, we, we snuck out there at like six in the morning before the race course and all the paddle boards were lined up and stuff. And I jumped in in my speedo and <laughs> swam the J course. Nice. And, uh, by the time I was like halfway out, I was out by this, like the kind of the midpoint is this big turn. It's a couple miles offshore called the mile buoy. And I was out there and uh, they had the camera boat out there. And I know the guys on the camera boat. So I'm swimming around the mile buoy and they're like, what are you doing out here? <laughs> <laughs> Like we just saw a huge great white, you know, like what are you doing? <laughs> and I was yeah. like, I'm swimming the J. <laughs> so that was really fun. And then all my friends started, you know, all the people, the race went by me about halfway into my swim and mm -hmm. all the pros were going by and all the big wave guys and everybody and like all the people from town and, you know, and I know a lot of them. So it's like, Scott, what are you doing out here? So that <laughs> was super fun. Yeah. yeah. So that was kind of the way to stay connected to the whole surfing community and all that while I was training mm -hmm. for swimming. Um, yeah, but then, and then we did, uh, yeah, so that was the first, like, that was training for the first English channel, all right, and then, um, so, like, you know, I had signed up for the English channel, I'd gotten a Tide, uh, and I somehow, I don't know why, but I think I was looking at it, doing it in 2017, but then I also, I, I forget why, but I booked another Tide in 2020 with uh, a different pilot. Okay. So I had 2017, I had a tide booked with Reg and Ray. And then in 2020, I had a tide booked with uh, Eddie Spelling. Huh. And, um, or maybe I didn't, I think maybe I waited, maybe it was after the first attempt that I booked the other tide, but I think I ended up booking two tides or something like that. Interesting. So, huh. Yeah. So anyway, I had a, it was 2017. I had a, I had a tide booked with um, Reg and Ray and we went and I thought, yeah, so I didn't book the second tide yet. So it was just, I had 2017 and I went over there because I was thinking, 
like it's going to be like Catalina. Like I'm just going to get get it done and go do it and all that. And you know, like if, if you talk to people that have never been to the English Channel, like a lot of people think it's this dirty, like kind of like um, scary, like kind of gray, uh, murky water. Hmm. You know, and there's so many ships; it must be polluted. It, uh, it's uh-huh. kind of a port, you know, and all that, you know, like Dover and all this stuff. And then I, I went over in 2016 to crew for Robin Rose's English Channel. Mm-hmm. And I got, I was fortunate enough to get to buddy swim with her. Nice. And uh, I got in and got to swim in the channel uh, next to the same boat too, next to Viking princess and um, that big blue, you know, big blue boat. And, and I was just like, Oh my God, it's beautiful out here. It's like such a beautiful place to swim. It's so beautiful. And, you know, there's the white cliffs when you leave England, like mm-hmm. when you leave Dover, there's white cliffs behind you. And then there's Cap Blanc, you know, when you get to France, all the white cliffs and all the beaches around Wasant Bay and, uh, and the Cape. And, and then not only that, but I mean, the swimming, the water's beautiful. And then at night, you know, you've got the ships and the ferries and the cruise ships and it's like everything's lit up and it's just like christmas out there you know everything wow. is so pretty and i thought wow god this is going to be great you know i'm so glad like that i get to do this and then and then we met all these people you get to know the people in dover and mm-hmm. um and folkestone and deal and it's just like I, I i just fell in love i fell in love with the whole coastline the whole dover area and all the people and like dover harbor and the whole scene and I was just like, okay, this is, this is amazing. Right. So I'm so lucky that I get to come back and do this for my mm-hmm. own. Swim. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and then in 2017, we went back and, uh, you know, for my own swim and I brought, I brought crew and it was like my wife and my, um, and then Kim and Robin came with me. And then we had people there that I had met and it was, um, like this big thing, you know, and we stayed at Varn Ridge and met more people, uh, and got, to be, uh, and like on Robin swim, we got to know, um, David and Evelyn that, you know, um, at Varn Ridge pretty well and got really close with them. And so it was like this magical place. Um, and so I go back in 2017. So here I am, I'm swimming and it was, you know, it wasn't great conditions. It was pretty choppy. They kept saying, is it going to get cleaned up? And I think Reg and Ray were like, it's going to get better. It never really got better. Um, but I, but I got started getting really sick after nine hours. Uh Oh, and so I started throwing up. I think I threw up for like two or three hours straight, like from nine to 12 or something. And then I finally just stopped eating, stopped drinking. And I got to where I was about like a mile and a half, you know, right off like uh, Sun God or something, or like one of those spots in there. And, and I was going toward Calais and I was super tired. Mm-hmm. They just decided that I wasn't going to make it, you know, uh-huh. I was like a mile and a half. It felt like I was, I felt like I was there. Right. Uh-huh. You know, such a short distance, you know, it looks so close at a mile. Right. And a half. Um, but I got pulled. So no. um, I had stomach problems and I was probably not uh, trained right for that swim. And my food mm-hmm. maybe wasn't agreeing with me, but, you know, I took away notes and lessons and changed my food and changed my training and, uh, and that kind of thing. And so went back and at, at the time I thought, I don't know if I'll come back, but then mm. I was like, yeah, I have to go back. So anyway, so that I know that we're getting close on time. So I'll kind of speed through this, but, um, so that, that was the first year English channel. Second year I go back. Um, second year, I just, I was, I had a problem. I was getting uh, gas fumes. I got really nauseous. I swam like six and a half hours. Couldn't hold down any food or water. I thought this is happening again. Right. So then I got, I basically, that one ended third year. I go back. Um, I felt great, had trained, never felt better. Um, it was really, really rough. It was super choppy. Um, but I, but I still felt really good. And so uh, here I am, like, I'm like a mile off of Wasant and I, you know, like the swell would go up and I could see the lights on the beach, you know, like, uh, the little houses above the up there and in, in town and um but i was getting pushed toward calais again oh. and they said uh so they said yeah no problem we're gonna he came out on the radio and said or he came out and said we talked to the french people and said you can get to we can land you by the harbor or on the other side of the harbor but then i guess that changed oh, no. i was about a mile off 
shore and they just came out and said you know we're not gonna let you cross the harbor or so we oh man <laughs> it was like three years getting pulled so that was 17 18 19 17 18 19 and then oh, the wow. pandemic hit right yeah 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 so um but i uh, i had had a tide that's where after after the first year i ended up booking a couple tides and so i had a tide for 2020 just sitting there that i thought i was going to sell so mm. i calling eddie and saying you know hey i'm good to, i want to do this next year and so um i had had that tied with eddie spelling and uh so yeah quarantine i had to go over there i quarantined for four weeks you know i'm in the hotel in london for like two i mean for two weeks before i went to dover for mm-hmm. two weeks and so i'm quarantined and felt like that like a scene out of like apocalypse now you know when martin sheen looks and he says oh i'm still in saigon you know like you know, first mission <laughs> That's how I felt like in London quarantined for two weeks, but then uh, went to Dover and, you know, court, so it was COVID and I, I decided to go alone, no crew. Yeah. So I'm totally relying on the kindness of strangers to like, wow, come make my swim happen. And I was really lucky to have uh, Kevin Murphy and Deborah Vine oh, wow. um, just come on my boat and be like, wow. <laughs> we're going to be your people. And so, I mean, you know, for, you know who those people are, but yeah, it's like people that live it the best in the business, you know, Kevin Murphy, King of the channel. Uh-huh. And so he was, he's the guy, you know, uh, Kevin and Deborah were taking care of me for the whole way. And, uh, and it was just the most magical, awesome swim I've ever done. It just all came together and Eddie got me there and, you know, it was just like amazing. And I've got a bunch of stories like within that swim, like we're, yeah middle of the night you know i'm just sitting there thinking about all that gratitude and all the people you know that made this happen in four years coming and all this you know and i'm looking up and i can see deborah and kevin smiling at me and um and it's the middle of the night you know and you're just thinking about all those people and and i like at one point i saw this little light like at the bottom like i thought i saw a light like a star you know down in the black water like deep 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 and I just felt uh-huh. like it kept getting brighter and brighter. And all of a sudden, it's almost like the water was backlit. Like it's almost daylight under the water, like it was glowing. And, I'm, huh. and I lift my head up to like look at the boat and it's still night. It's like blackout, but inside the water. So I don't know if I was hallucinating. Or what, <laughs> I was like, you know, it was kind of like this giant bioluminescent kind of like event, but it wasn't wow. it was just in my mind. But I'm, and mm-hmm. then I just felt it like lift me up. You know, I just felt like I was, the water got light. I just felt like I was being carried across and neat. It's kind of magical. Felt like I was just being carried by some higher power. It was really, really, really amazing. And wow. Uh, Have you had any other experiences like that in the ocean? Not I mean, like you've that. told us how much uh, it meant to you. So it yeah. I mean, I've had some pretty cool things happen. Like, I mean, swimming with whales in Monterey Bay. I've had, wow. I've had great whites swim under me, you know, the, I had a whale come up to feed off anchovies when I was swimming accidentally through like a bait ball and <laughs> I had a whale come literally up and move me out of the way. Like, <laughs> like it did, it was so close to me that just the, the water displaced me and I came up wow. and I was treading water and I could see it like it, the, just the nose, like six feet out of the water with like water and fish coming out of its mouth. And it closed up its mouth and slow motion went right back into the water right next to me. And then just swam around a little bit and then disappeared. <sighs> and there's like amazing. really cool stuff that happens out here in Monterey Bay. That's so cool. Man, but, I want to um, come visit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, so I, you know, four years English channel. I mean, my advice would be never give up, right? If you're going to, if you have something that you're passionate about, like that swim, just don't ever don't ever lose the dream, right? You may think it's a, you may think that it's a one-year journey or a six-month journey or a two-year journey, but maybe it's going to be like a four-year journey or five-year Did journey. Did you feel like the pull, like you had to go back? Like it was like, you definitely I, couldn't just walk away from it. <laughs> I felt like I couldn't, I couldn't die before I finished that swim. Like I had, I had to get that done. Like if I, I was going to be like, you know, a hundred years old just going back every year, <laughs> going back every year. <laughs> just to do the swim until it I had to like sell it... my house and because uh, it's expensive too, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It was terrible. <laughs> wow. It sounds, I mean, I have not had the 
pleasure of enjoying that experience in Dover, but it, I mean, it sounds like you were really drawn into the whole, well, the whole experience. And so I to, to be back. able to go back, yeah. I want to go back and crew for people or maybe even take a vacation there without the oh, stress yeah. of the swim. Right. Yeah. 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 Just be able to go to the pub, you know, I just want to go live there for like uh, six months. If anybody wants to go right. <laughs> six months. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. A year, two years. Yeah. And trying to figure out how I can go move to England. Cause then maybe I could just get one of those like, Oh, the boat's open. We don't have our swimmer here. Can you want to go across? And I'll be like, yes. Yeah, <laughs> Instead exactly, of like, right? it's the weather window at the time. You know, I just want to yeah, do a relay where there's no stress. Right. It's just like right. fun. You just go yeah. out there and swim. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you one quick story. So yeah. I, on my first English channel swim, I, you know, I had thought my wife and I, before we went to the swim, we had gone to uh uh, or no, right after the swim, I kind of went back to London. We spent a couple of days to kind of nurse my wounds and try to like get <laughs> undepressed. You yeah. know, it's depressing not to finish. Yeah. So we went to Harrods and we went, they were doing caviar tasting. And so <laughs> we're like tasting this amazing, like really expensive caviar. I was, she doesn't eat caviar, but I'm an idiot. And she goes, would you like to buy some? And it's like, you know, like three or 400 bucks for like a little tin. Oh, geez. And, and, and I go, I don't deserve that. I didn't like Oh. It's like, do you want it as a, like a, like a reward or something? And I was like, no, I'll, I will, I will come back and buy this tin of caviar when I finish the English channel. <laughs> so, you know, year two comes by. I'm like, this is the year I get the caviar. You know? <laughs> Never happened. Year three, no, no caviar for Scott. Right. So um, I'm back there alone because, you know, I'm traveling alone now for mm-hmm. 2020 and I finish the swim and I'm, I'm on a high, you know, and I, I say goodbye. I'm staying at Kevin Murphy's place and I say goodbye nice. to Kevin and Kathy Batts and Deborah and all those people, you know, there and, and um, get, take my last swim in, the, in Dover Harbor before I leave and take the train. I go back to London and I've got a couple nights in London before I fly out. Mm-hmm. And so I go, I'm going to get that caviar. So I go, I go to Herod's. And I go into there where they sell the caviar, you know, and I'm like, I'll take that and that. I ended up spending like, <laughs> I think like $500 with the caviar. I bought, you know? <laughs> so they give it to me and the guy gives it to me in a little pouch that's referred, like, it's like below, you know, it's really, really cold. It's like frozen mm-hmm. ice. And he goes, okay, you need to keep this like below zero degrees or something. And I said, but I'm flying out tomorrow. You know, what am I going to do on the airplane? He goes, well, I guess you're eating caviar tonight. <laughs> I had no idea that you had to eat it, you know, like that you had to keep it in the freezer. Or whatever. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I've got this caviar I'm back in my hotel and I, and I, uh, I sent a text message to, um, uh, Van Cornwall. He's a South Ender, another guy from California that was there and swam the channel the same week I did and him and his wife were there and they just happened to be in London uh-huh. for a couple of days. So I said, meet me at this you know, <laughs> campaign bar in, uh, in London and we're going to have caviar. So, <laughs> we sat together and celebrated our swims with, you know, kind of the, the caviar that I've had waited, that I had waited four years for to, four years for, wow. Four years to eat. Oh man. Wow. That's okay. well-earned caviar. Yeah. I'm <laughs> I you treat yourself a little bit. Yeah. I'm glad you're able to um, yeah. enjoy it with someone too. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, Anything on your horizon now? Or are you just resting post English channel? <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, so this last year I took kind of took a year off. I've been trying to surf more this last year and I've been trying to do more like volunteer, you know, observing swims, crewing swims. We have a little Zodiac here. So we've been taking people out to do like 10 and 20 K swims. Nice. Uh, just friends. And um, so a lot of work on Monterey Bay Swim Association this year, but um, yeah, I mean, it's, you know how it is. It's like, you think like you're never really done right you, know, you start going out oh, maybe this is my last swim but then it's like a couple like before the boat even gets back to the harbor you're already thinking okay this is the first next then after that i'm gonna do this then after that i'm gonna do that yeah so i mean i want to do i'm gonna hopefully next summer be able to get in and swim around manhattan because manhattan, uh, right? yep. i get my triple crown and um, <laughs> i still haven't swum i've done a lot of swimming in lake tahoe but not the length mm-hmm. and so if i do that then you have your I'll have my double triple crown. Yeah. <laughs> California triple crown. Yeah. <laughs> but I've yeah. always wanted to swim Tahoe anyway, even before yeah. it was like really, really popular. So that's something I, I really want to go do. It's kind of a special swim to me. Um yeah. and then you know, Monterey Bay, it's right here. I mean it's like literally right there in my backyard. So um uh you know that's that's probably next on my list. Like my next big epic obsession is Monterey Bay. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, that, that's kind of, that's kind of like next on the horizon. Yeah. 
yeah that's a big one well that's all all they're all big right but yeah it's all big but it's like you know it's like we said you gotta you just set the goal Mm -hmm. and then all the good stuff happens like on the way to the goal like all the good stuff happens in between so i have that's one of the things i've learned right is that you set the goal then you can't really think about it anymore so Mm -hmm. if i decide it's monterey bay or if it was something else um the exciting thing is that I know I've got all this time and all these people and all this time in the ocean and everything that I'm now going to be kind of inspired and motivated to do. Like Mm -hmm. I'll be up at before sunrise in the ocean and watching the sunrise over SoCal Cove over the Santa Cruz mountains. And yeah, you know, that's the, that's the motivation to get out there, the goal, but it's really, that's the reward is in that everyday stuff that happens. I love that. Yeah. I'm gonna hold on to that one. It's a good yeah, place to it really it is. Yeah, you set the goal, you forget about it, and then you just kind of live the day to day, right? Um you, you know, you have to do the work, right? That's I mean, mm-hmm. a lot of people get hung up on the goal and they end up not doing the work. So, but it's you know, this sport, you have to do the work. There's no <laughs> there's no hiding from that. <laughs> no. It, you know, yep. it'll, come back to get you later if you don't. <laughs> right, um, right. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, you know, it's like all that hard stuff is good, like from things that are hard, like from great, great difficulty, sometimes great pain, but that, you know, from that comes great beauty and, you know, like you, we get a lot, of, there's so much we get out of that. It's yeah. pretty amazing. Yep. So. Thank you so much <laughs> for sharing your story, Scott. I love it. Uh, You're welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. I hope you enjoyed today's interview. Do you want to take Marathon Swim Stories with you? Subscribe on your favorite podcast provider. Want to connect with like-minded limit pushers? Join us for Marathon Swim Stories Live on Tuesdays at 5.30 a.m. Pacific, 8.30 Eastern, 13.30 GMT. Thanks for watching.